I believe that sometimes the transition from something which is old to new or something which is familiar to maybe unfamiliar is not always the easiest of things to experience. We've all known something about being unsettled in our circumstances and in our personal environment. If any of you have moved uh, more than several times, you will know something about that. Our first few years here in London were marked by either child coming into the world or boxes being packed to move house. So we had those years of being very unsettled for a long time. And of course, it carries with it a sense of being uneasy. You're never settled. Uh, you're never quite sure in your mind. And that's something we can all relate to. I believe that whenever the apostle was writing these words in Hebrews chapter 4 and, and in verse 14, that he certainly had in mind that there was a shift uh, that those to whom he was writing had to experience. And he was trying to help them. He was trying to guide them and instruct them through all the changing scenes of time in their life. And of course, the change was for good. And the transition was a good transition because, of course, he was dealing with Jewish believers who had come out of uh, the darkness of relying upon the law and the ceremony as a way of to heaven and to life. And they had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for them, as we shall see, this was a great change. Uh, this was a transition uh, that for many of them they found difficult when it came to certain particulars. And so whenever the apostle is uh, writing here, we should understand that that is something which he has in mind. Now the apostle Paul, if we take him to be the penman of, of Hebrews, is the reason why we should not. If we take the apostle Paul as the example, you'll find that Paul is someone who does this on other occasions when he's dealing uh, not just with Jews, but when he's dealing with the Gentiles. When he's dealing with those who had been called from a, a Gentile or a heathen background. And it's always a, a good way in which you can study the scriptures when he writes to the Ephesians. Or he writes to those that were uh, non-Jews and who had come to Christ in faith. He had often written many letters and words to those who were of a previous heathen, ungodly mindset, uh, who spiritually and inwardly were engrossed by the darkness of superstition or pagan rituals and ways, or else had relied upon the philosophies of men. And when the Apostle Paul would write to them, he would refer to those past experiences as a way of reminding them of that stupendous change which had taken place. And I'll give you one example, Ephesians 5 in verse 8. He says, you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. And then he emphasizes the change. He says, remember what you were, remember what you now are in Christ. And then he gives the instruction. He says, walk, walk as children of light. And as I said, that shift which many who were, were in that Gentile world or those who had no uh, experience to the, the privileges of the Old Testament scriptures who had relied upon just man's philosophies and thinkings and ways, to them the whole transition from darkness to light was something which they had, of course, never known before. This was a, a totally new experience. And it brought with it a whole new way of thinking and living and doing. And so when Paul addresses them, you will find that he caters to that end. He ministers accordingly. And that's wise, and that's right, and that's good. And so we say the same here in Hebrews 4. That the reason why there is this tremendous emphasis upon the things that God's people who were from a Jewish background, what they have, as I said last week, just by way of repeating certain things, is, is to remind them they have not lost out in any respect by coming to Christ, but rather they have gained the fullness of Christ. And so as he reaches to these individuals where they were, he impresses upon their minds that they have, as we read there in verse 14 and verse 15, they have a great high priest. They don't need to long for something or wish for something they once had. He says you have him. You have the great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, that who is passed into glory itself. It's only fitting then that he develops this. 
It wouldn't be right for him to go so far and leave it there. So that is why he continues in verse 15. And and by way of contemplating these verses, we realize that uh, at the same time as he was uh, aware of the reality of wavering with the faith and the need to exhort Christians in that respect, he is also aware that as the people of God, that we are filled with many weaknesses. And we are subject to many struggles. And then there is not one Christian on the face of God's earth who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to say, you know, I know nothing of what it means to be weak as a Christian. And I have never experienced the infirmities of the flesh and the sorrows and all the things that attend my way. And so what really constitutes an incredibly important doctrinal portion of God's word, and dear friend, I remind you that it is a a very important part of Scripture because it underscores and it emphasizes what we call the impeccability. And for the little ones who are here, maybe for each of us who are here, just remind you that when we refer to the impeccability of Jesus Christ, we are not just saying that Jesus Christ did not sin, we are saying that he could not sin. That is a very important distinction. The view we have of our Lord Jesus must be the, the highest view that scripture gives unto us. And you'll see that at the end of verse 15, that tremendous statement, yet without sin. So it's a doctrinal portion, but with it, well, the practical implications are many and they are vast. And it's with this portion that I seek to come alongside you this morning, where you are, where you are in your life right now, and to encourage you and to feed you in respect to your struggles and to give you confidence as you navigate your way throughout them. And there are uh, two things I wish to leave with you this morning. First of all, I want to remind you that in this particular truth, our apprehensions are addressed. Our God has, in his word, addressed all of our concerns, all of our apprehensions, and all of our struggles and our fears. So how does he do this? Well, notice there in verse 15 that, first of all, there is an addressing of what may be a pessimistic tendency within Christian life. He addresses that negativity or that pessimism that might uh, overcome us at times. Now, I say this for a reason, not just because it might sound okay, but look at verse 15. For we have not. Now, notice the structure of the first sentence. We have not, he says, an high priest which cannot be touched. Now, those of us who have some experience with with English grammar, uh, we all understand that a double negative is something which is a bit of a grammatical blunder. It happens, it takes place, we won't even do it ourselves at times without even knowing. So what is a double negative in English? Well, here are a few examples. If someone says, um, I cannot see or I can't see no one in the crowd, uh, well, that means uh, sort of in an ironic sense they are seeing someone because it's counseling out the very thing they're trying to say. If someone says, I I can't find my keys nowhere, so it's a double negative. You're counseling out the the very thing that you intend to say. You might look at verse 15 and say, well, is that a double negative? We have not an high priest which cannot be touched. It is not a double negative. It, It might come across as seeming to be clumsy in its wording, but in fact, it's very important what the apostle is saying in that particular statement. Rather, what you find is that the Holy Spirit, as he moves this way to pen these words, is joining together two negative statements in order to affirm a truth. So the way in which you handle it is by simply dividing it in two. He's saying, we have not a high priest. In other words, he's saying, Christian, you have a high priest. Then he says in the next breath, which cannot be touched. And he's saying, he is touched. And it's the way in which, of course, we read this verse, which is very important. The answer as to why he doesn't just say, we have a high priest who is touched, that would seem to make more sense. Why form it in this way? Why not just say, we have a high priest who is touched? Because there is this need to emphasize something which is constantly escaping our hearts and our minds. It's an emphasis of Scripture. 
And human nature being what it is, I don't know how everyone is here. I know with human experience that some people are more positive. You know, you could throw anything at them and they're always upbeat and they're always seeing the bright side of things. Other people are sort of more negative and they see the, the, the worst side of things. I don't really think that's coming into the equation here. Rather, the tendency, even as Christians, is that we fixate upon all the things that we don't have and all the things that we might miss out on, and all the things that we might do which are grievous to God. And he's drawing alongside the Christian now, and he's saying, remember what you have in him. You have not an high priest which cannot be touched. And immediately the mind of the reader is gripped by this. What's he saying? He's saying, you have him. And he's saying that he is touched, as we shall see with the feelings of your infirmities. Certainly by wording this particular truth in this way, there is a, an unleashing of the sword of the Spirit, isn't there, which is mentioned there in verse 12. It's quick, it's alive, it's powerful. I believe the Lord's intention, either within these verses, as he addresses something of the doubting and fearful minds of God's people in respect to the whole transition. He says, you have him. God's word was like a sword within the hearts in this respect. Furthermore, he didn't just address these pessimistic concerns, but there was also an addressing of a personal aspect. Everyone likes it when there's a word for them, and when there is a personal element to God's word to their own heart. Now, I, I want to say to you this morning, the personal element within God's word here is far more important than you may realize when you cast your eye upon the scripture. Now I remind you of what Hebrews 5 and 1 says. If you just glance over a few verses to Hebrews 5 and verse 1. Now again, keep in your mind the whole background. Speak to these Jewish converts who are familiar with the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, the ceremonies, all these things. So this was all, in a sense, second nature to them. And as he speaks to them in Hebrews 5, in verse 1, he says, Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. Now, not only was that underscoring and reminding the people of the one that must stand in their stead as a substitute and one representing them, which of course is fulfilled in Christ in the greatest sense, there is also something very relevant for the people here. You know, whenever it comes to that horrible world of politics that no one really ever likes and enjoys, one of the things that tends to buy or get votes is when people think, well, someone identifies with them. They don't seem quite so detached and um, uh, you know, unconcerned with their needs. And for the Jewish people under their old system uh, and under the, the, the Levitical priesthood, there was something of that, that relevant nature because it was one of them that represented them. Before Almighty God. It didn't see so far. It didn't see so great the gap and the distance. And so you'll find that when the apostle here in verse 14 says to these individuals, you have a great high priest. And then it says, Jesus, the Son of God, which is passed into the heavens. The thought may have been, what, is he too far from us? Is he so far removed that... We don't know who he is, and for some Christians, that's how they live, by the way. That's how we engage in our Christianity, and wrongly we do that. Because even though he is the Son of God who is on high, and even though he is at the Father's right hand, we find now the heart of the Apostle being drawn to remind the people that he's not far from you. This is in the very glory, and he's in heavens itself. He is passed into the heavens, but he's touched by all of your experiences, every single one. And, and I can only go as, as far as I can, my thoughts and explanation as to these things, as to the outworkings of these. He who fills heaven, our God, and he who is at the Father's right hand, our Christ. This God is very near to us. And so the personal aspect is very near to us, very precious to us. And it's a reminder to us as a means of comfort and food to our soul that when you, my dear friend, if you are the Lord's, and I say to any who also are under their 
a burden of guilt of sin who are not in Christ, the Lord is near and willing to save you as well. But for those of us who are Christians, I remind you that when you are pressed down under the burden of your infirmities, that the very thing that you should do is run to these sort of scriptures. You go to them as quickly as you possibly can. And you remind yourself that when you are in that position where you feel isolated and alone, and as if God is very far from you, he is touched by the feelings of all your infirmities. But notice, uh, secondly, this is more my main point to you this morning, that our contemplations are instructed as well. Not just our apprehensions are addressed, but our contemplations or our meditations are instructed and they are guided. Now, I want you to do a bit of a word study with me this morning, so it will require you turning to a portion in a moment, and it will require you staying with me in uh, my thoughts. I was on the phone to someone the other day, uh, just clarifying my own thoughts as to making sure I was getting it right as to the word and so forth. So I, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to see sort of puzzled eyes and uh, confused heads. Uh, not that you give me that look anyway, but uh, just in case it ever occurs here in the church, the word infirmities, look at Hebrews 4 and verse 15. It says, with the feeling of our infirmities. I believe it's right for me to do this this morning. If we are to gauge the extent of our Lord Jesus Christ sympathizing for us and how he is touched by us, what we have to do, first of all, is to understand, well, what are these infirmities? How broad is this? How far-reaching is the application of this word infirmity in respect to Christ being touched by them. The great reformer John Calvin said this, that it includes both external evils and internal feelings of the soul. In other words, he was just simply saying, not just the temptations to sin, but in a broad sense, all of the weaknesses, all of those uh, elements in respect to our humanity, all of the strivings, all of the burdens, all of these things, he sees it, and rightly so, in a very comprehensive fashion. Now, I said you want to turn with me to somewhere. Turn with me to Matthew 8, verse 17. I'm sort of straying a little bit here. and I'll try not to stray too far and get lost, but we'll get back on track in a moment. Matthew 18, or Matthew 8, sorry, and verse 17. Matthew 8 and verse 17. What we're doing here is we're, we're looking at the Greek word, uh, for infirmity and how it's translated and used in other places. Matthew 8 and verse 17. Now, just a bit of a background about this chapter. We are told in Matthew 8 uh, about uh, various things taking place, one of which was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. So, of course, with mother-in-laws around, that's a good thing, isn't it? We don't want the mother-in-laws to, to be touched and restored. Well, Peter's mother-in-law was healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Also then, those that were possessed with devils, those that were uh, with sicknesses, there was this tremendous demonstration of the, the miracle ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, in the doctrinal sense, which set forth the person of the Son of God, demonstrated who he was to the people. But notice with me Matthew 8, verse 17, and how Matthew connects the fulfilling of Scripture to the miracles of Christ. And he says that it might be fulfilled. This was after the healing, after the restoration. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities, there's the word, and bear our sicknesses. And Isaiah 53, verse 4, for reference, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now let's pause for a moment in these words. You can't avoid one thing. You can't avoid the link between the fulfilling of Scripture in Isaiah to the very uh, miracle ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in connection to his redemptive work. Now that creates a bit of a quandary. It might do initially in our thoughts. And therefore it's important to ask ourselves some questions. What does he mean and what does he not mean when it comes to things like healing? Now, this is a big subject, and it's one that I can't really explain just a few sentences. But, of course, on the one hand, what you see around us in many churches is this push and a sort of ministry where they, they advertise almost healing upon demand. 
like, like on tap. You turn it and it happens. And if you, if you doubt that in any particular way you have a, a spirit of unbelief or you're not living as you should as a Christian. I think for any Christian who is mature, who knows the word of God, they will realize that, of course, that creates all sorts of problems. It creates a tier system within Christendom. Because you, you have some that seem to be more spiritual because they see all these things happening, and we don't see these things happening. You have, of course, also an abuse of Scripture, and you have really a violation of the centrality of redemption Scripture, as we shall see. And at the same time, we should not have a knee-jerk reaction and avoid what Scripture says in relation to physical restoration. So much so that we can say, and I will seek to explain it, that by virtue of redemption, that full physical restoration is also confirmed. But just not yet. Now we're going to look at this in a, just a, a brief way, and it will help us in our thoughts in verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 4. We must remember that when Christ bears our sicknesses, it doesn't mean that he became sick. So he, he didn't take uh, the cancer for an individual. He didn't take some sort of infection for another person. Rather, he deals with the root matter, which is sin. And he deals with it in that comprehensive way, in that total way. Not dealing just with the pollution and the guilt of sin, but the penalty of sin and all the things that concern sin. And parts of it we experience now, and the full enjoyment of it we shall receive in glory. And so we must remind ourselves that when it says that he bears our infirmities, that he himself does not become sick. But rather, he takes the punishment for sin. Furthermore, the idea, as I said, of healing is therefore not something that is on demand, because just as Christ healed people, as Matthew says, does not then uh, mean that we can have that same authority. There's nowhere in Scripture that reminds us of that or teaches us in that respect. Can the Lord heal in a moment? Of course he can. Should we pray for it? Of course we should. Can we demand it? No, we can't. Are we subject to God's will and his ways? Yes, we are. And remind yourself of this one overriding truth, that if there is, as some people teach, and it's a, um, a wrong biblical teaching, it's a wrong teaching of Scripture, they will say that because the, the Christ died and shed his blood, therefore we will be healed in this life. Well, ask yourself the question, did all the people in Matthew 8 die? Well, of course they did. They all were subject to death itself. So that, does that mean a cross was a failure? Of course it doesn't. You see, this, this idea that somehow there's a, a guarantee that every ailment, every sickness, every infirmity can be dealt with by Christ. Well, what happens when we are sick? Uh, has, has Christ failed in some capacity? Is our faith not strong enough? Is that where, where we're going in our understanding of Scripture? And so we must be careful in our thoughts of these things. So then what we can say, how do you explain Matthew 8? How do you explain its relationship to Calvary and redemption and the scripture being fulfilled and all this? It is simply this, because one day, my dear friend, these vile bodies, these lowly bodies, these bodies that are uh, earthly tabernacles that for many of you are filled with so many um, problems and afflictions and struggles, they shall, by virtue of Christ's wonderful redemption, they shall be changed. And perfect healing and restoration we shall know when we are glorified. That's the final culmination of all things. There is no other way of explaining those verses, by the way, in a way that makes sense scripturally. You may suggest some, and I'm quite happy to, to hear that, but I believe that's the most consistent way of looking at those portions. So then what I say to you this morning is that in determining the word infirmities in Hebrews 4, our weaknesses, what I say to you is that it is very broad. And it takes in the whole range of our human feeling and our suffering and our pain and our anguish and our temptations as far as is not being sinful is concerned because of Christ it was without sin. So then we can return back to our text as we close this morning. And here now we stop to apply the word of God to our hearts. And I will try with you somehow to, 
to, to, to fathom or to understand and, and grasp these things? What does it mean that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, that he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin? What do I see here? What do you see? A Christian, what I see is the full spectrum of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, his full humanity being brought before us here. We are to be silent in the presence of this and moved by this. And in trying to really structure my thoughts for you this morning as a way of giving understanding, I leave you with these two final Conclusions that in Christ we have one who is our sympathizing Savior. I say that because the word touched is precisely what that means. That to be touched is to sympathize. And again, I remind you that the apostle here, he speaks in a present tense, doesn't he? As he says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched. The inference is very clear that in our present need right now, my friend, he is touched. Where you are. So that we're able to say that in all the sufferings of our Savior, that he not only endured them to satisfy divine justice and free us from the guilt of our sin and the penalty of, of hell itself, but he has done so not in some mechanical fashion or detached manner, but that he also sympathizes. Like no one else can and no one else will ever do. It is not worth asking, some have come down this line where they sort of go a bit too deep in their thoughts, and they say, well, does that mean that he's filled with sorrow? Now, in heaven, I thought heaven was a place of no tears and no grief and so forth. Well, we're really probing into mysteries that we can't explain there. All I know is that the scripture reminds me that where he is, he's touched. And he sympathizes. And, and in Hebrews 2, in verse 18, we read that in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able. That's the same idea here, to succor them that are tempted. Now, I must add that these um, sympathies are not just simply feelings of identity, but rather there's a stronger idea behind the word that in the sympathizing of Christ, he moves himself to help you. He moves himself to aid you, and to support you, and to sustain you. He is the one who is our sympathizing Savior. He is also then our suffering Savior. Because how could someone sympathize if they have not suffered? And for this, I, I, I wish for your thoughts to come with me this morning as we come to a close. The apostle's main argument is really this, isn't it, in verse 15? We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And it's almost as if you hear the questions being asked, well, how does he do this? How does he do this? How do I know this is true? Show me something. Give me something concrete that I can hold with my hands, I can, I can embrace with my heart as to how I know that Christ is touched with the feelings of my infirmities. And now the mind of every thought and every heart is brought to this. He is touched because he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, I, I, I say in a practical level, one-to-one -one amongst ourselves, we don't always need to go through a particular experience to sympathize with someone else. You may not have lost someone, but you can certainly sympathize in a respect with someone who has lost. You can try to imagine. And yet it must be true also to say that it is only when you come across someone who has gone through the very same valley as you, that that degree of identity and sympathy is somewhat more intense. That's not to say that Someone can't identify who hasn't experienced, but rather if they have gone through it, they know a little bit more about what you're going through. And that is precisely what the, the scriptures are saying to us this morning. In all points, he says. In all points. Tempted or tried is really the word that we have here, like as we are, yet without sin. So while the reference to without sin reminds us uh, that the only exception is that while at times we can enter into sorrows that lead us on to sin, right, we can be entered into temptation that leads us to sin, not so with Christ. 
And far from meaning that somehow means he's not able to sympathize, it means he is better qualified. Because it means that his heart and his, his mind, if I can use these expressions here, are not murdered with the pollution of unbelief. That could be a problem with me. I, I, I sympathize with you and all the things that you go through, but I'm only flesh and blood. And I have my own concerns and I have my own needs. And, and I can be distracted and I can be forgetful. And, and all those things we can all say one of another, but never of our Christ. Never does he forget, never does he overlook, never does he fail to be touched with every point in which you are struggling. Isn't that remarkable? Is there any other Savior like this? Is there any other God like this? Is there any other faith like this? There is nothing like this. This is the living word of God that is before us this morning. And you say, you know, I, I can't really believe that. Really? In every point like I am, well, we can just go through a few things, can't we, this morning as we finish. Do you know poverty? Do you know poverty? Do you know what it means to have hardships financially? Do you think that's outside the realm of Christ identifying with you? Do you really think that's the case? No, the Bible says that the foxes, or Jesus says the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has not anywhere to lay his head. And he subjected himself to poverty. The words of him have been going through my mind the last few days. I haven't sung them in case I've scared the family. But I've just I've left the words going through my mind out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Only my great Redeemer's love made him go. You know poverty, my friend? He knows poverty. Do you know rejection? Little ones know rejection at times at school. They don't like it. And as adults and Christians, we can know rejection on the basis of our faith and other respects of Christ. It says he came unto his own and his own received him not. That's rejection. In every point like as you are, yet without sin. Do you know betrayal? He was betrayed by a treacherous kiss by the, the one who promised to be the closest to him, his familiar friend, his companion. Do you know heavy burdens, I say, look to the Garden of Gethsemane. I see the, the Son of Man, the Son of God, there upon his knees, yea, prostrate on the ground, your maker lies with dust and dirt within his mouth as the very sweat drops of blood swept down his brow as he anticipated the burden of enduring the sins that we deserve, the punishment of them. Do you know burdens? He's tempted in all points like as you are, but without sin. Do you know what it means to cry? And on your quiet time as tears cascade down your face, he wept over Lazarus. Even though he would raise him to life, he still wept over him. Yet he stood over a city that rejected him, and he wept over their unbelief and their sin. Do you know hunger? Very few of us, we know what hunger is, really, in its fullest extent. We all have the ones, also little ones, and we did ourselves, didn't we? You go three hours up food, I'm starving. And no, you're not starving, uh, you're greedy. You just need to wait a little bit longer for your food. But we all have that experience. But those in the world know hunger. He fasted for those 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says, very simply afterwards, afterward, he hungered. He knew hunger and thirst. Did he not cry upon the cross? I thirst. Did he not know pain? Do you know pain? Dear brother and sister in Christ, the last while some of you have been in hard pains, difficult situations. Your bodies are racked with pain. And it's not coming to an end, is it? And you're wondering where you're going with it. The Bible says of Jesus in just one respect, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men, every beating, every bruising, every lash, and not just those physical pains, but every spiritual inward grief and agony of soul, so that none suffered like as he suffered. You know, abandonment. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you know the approach of death? 
he went through the valley of death. He knew that his life was to die and to give his life a ransom for many. My dear friend, what I'm saying to you is that you cannot enter into a sorrow which Christ has not entered into and knows more than you will ever possibly know. So when the Lord says that he's touched with the feelings of your infirmities, these are not words to mock you or ridicule you or to lure you into some full sense of security. But rather he said, I know where you are. And I will come to where you are. And I will support you where you are. And I will pray for you where you are. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, yet without sin. That means he's reliable. That means he's dependable. That means he's strong. And that means, my friend, he's the one that you go to every day, every week, every month. Go to him. Thank God we can say this morning, if we are the Lord's, can't we? It rejoices our heart. It should draw our hearts in gladness. We say it with a smile on our faces, even if there's a, a burden upon our brow. We say we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We have one who is, who is tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And can I say to anyone who is not a Christian, whether young or old, he's the one that you need right now. He's the one that bears the sins of the world. He takes our guilt. He takes our sin. He takes the punishment for it. He provides heaven by enduring hell. And it must be to him that we come right now. We come while we have time. God bless his word to our hearts.